Uh, we continue in the Persevere series tonight. I invite you to open your Bibles and turn to chapter 4 of that book. And I don't know if you've ever had a repair person or a mechanic come to your house, work on your car, take everything apart, and then uh, say that the work day was over and they'd have to come back later and try to sort it all out. And you say, what do I do with all these parts in the meantime? Well, I kind of felt that way uh, last time we were in Hebrews, chapter 3, going into chapter 4. At least for me, it's a very difficult passage, and uh, we spent just enough time in it last time we were together, uh, maybe to raise some questions and to... uh, get you to scratch your head about some things and hopefully we'll get down through the end of the paragraph looking to get through the end of verse 13 this evening and uh, without going uh, terribly long and um, I think the writer of Hebrews does intentionally uh, make us question some things part of his goal is to uh, maybe knock us off the center of what would be uh, a comfort zone uh, an apathetic complacency or uh, feeling that we're, we're okay, we're coasting in the Christian life or riding the coattails, the wave of, of the church movement, and to really get us to examine our hearts and to question where we are in our devotion to the Lord, to make sure that we are saved and that as believers that we're keeping our eyes fixed on uh, the captain of our salvation, uh, the one who chapter 3 uh, and, and uh, verse 4, well, one calls our apostle and the high priest of our profession uh, to look to Jesus and to continue and persevere in our sure and finished faith. Well, the outline, which we uh, uh, went through st- about really only got about a third of the way through last time, was uh, it, we'll go ahead and just put all three of those points up there. Uh, this is a passage that has to do with the message title, Fear striving and rest and we began to talk about how God wants us to have all of those in a healthy way none of them in an unbiblical way or to the wrong extreme or the wrong kind of these things but fear striving and rest we have fear a healthy reverent uh, respectful fear of God and his consequences for uh, actions that we choose in our lives because hard hearted unbelief whether it's in a believer or an unbeliever, uh, may be judged harshly uh, and will be judged harshly when it is unrepentant. Uh, We strive because new-hearted belief is characterized by perseverance. When you talk about eternal security, the doctrine that once a person is saved, that person is always saved. They're given everlasting life, which cannot be revoked. We believe the Bible teaches that. There are two sides of that, a divine side and a human side. The divine side we call preservation, that God holds the believer in his hand, John 10 tells us, and no man can pluck him out of the Father's hand. But the other side, the the divine preservation, the human side, is perseverance. That means as believers, we don't just go to sleep in that hand and do nothing for the Lord and and, uh, uh, live how we want and and, uh, just expect heaven's rewards in the next life, but perseverance means we continue in that faith and hold on to that confidence and serve the Lord uh, during the days that he gives us on this earth. So we strive for new-hearted belief that's characterized by perseverance, and we're seeking to enter into God's rest, and that rest is because God's finished work affords eternal peace for the believer. Well, in chapter 3, Uh, The writer of Hebrews uh, hearkens back to uh, the Israelite exodus in the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers and tells about how, uh, reminds his readers of the rebellion, of the hard-heartedness of those Israelites. Um, And he quotes the 95th Psalm. If you remember, as you glance back at chapter 3, verses 7 through 11 are a quotation directly from Psalm 95 where the psalmist writes, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts like they did in the wilderness of temptation and of, uh, of complaining. And uh, wherefore, because of that hard-hearted complaining, verse 11 says, God's reaction was, I swear in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. And the last three verses of chapter 3 help Uh, the readers of this epistle to identify with those Israelites to know that every one of them, the only exceptions being the youth 
And Joshua and Caleb, the hundreds of thousands of those adult Israelites, though many of them we'll see in heaven, experienced the harsh judgment of hard-hearted sin against God. So verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left to us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So this uh, command of fear, I think it's for unbelievers as well as believers. For unbelievers, uh, or for someone who maybe has thought of themselves as a believer, but can't identify Christian fruit in their lives, can't really uh, claim an authentic relationship with God in their day-to-day experience, uh, and maybe is just basing their Uh, salvation status on their family that they grew up in, the church that they have been connected with, or a school, or even a prayer that they prayed. I want to say that my salvation testimony, I go back to a prayer when I accepted Christ as Savior. That's what the Bible says, to be saved. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. So I'm not saying that we aren't converted in a moment, and that isn't expressed by a prayer. However, uh, repeating a prayer that response is not mixed with faith, uh, then it doesn't save. And so many people today uh, who identify as Christian and will check that born-again box when they fill out a survey uh, don't have that faith. Verse 2 says, For unto us the gospel was preached as well as to them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. We need to make sure that you are saved, that that Jesus is your Savior. But if you're saved, the fear is a healthy one. Even as we remember, many of those Israelites, we will see in heaven. People like Aaron and her, and and uh, last time I said Phineas, but Phineas was uh, came later. He was in the Promised Land. Someone helped me to uh, get that straightened out after last time. But God judges hard-hearted unbelief harshly, even for the believer. Sometimes we think that if if we're saved, that Jesus bore the penalty of our sin on the cross, and hallelujah, he did, but sometimes we think that means we'll never suffer consequences for our sin. Well, the Bible shows us, even in this example, a situation where people were kept out of the promised land, where people lost their physical lives, even believers, because of their hard-hearted unbelief. And to show how serious God was about that, I just want to glance back once again quickly at Numbers chapter 14. And you can listen or you can follow along if you care to turn there. But just to highlight, this is when Israel was at the border of the promised land. Joshua and Caleb were ready to go in, but everyone else uh, feared. So the giants were too big. They were too many. They they were too tall. Their military was better. It would seem like grasshoppers in their sight, they objected. And to that hard-hearted unbelief, even though many of them, again, as God's chosen people, will spend eternity with him, I would even suggest the majority of them were were true, genuine believers. This is Jesus' response to that hard-hearted unbelief. Numbers 14, 21 says, But as truly as I live, and that's how God introduces the judgment that he is to indict. Verse 28, Say unto them, As truly as I live, should have read verse 22, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. And as you read through, if you're following our Bible reading calendars uh, this year, uh, we're about halfway through Exodus. And as you uh, listen to and read and study that account, you can almost count the ten times that Israel hardens their hearts and chooses not to believe God and to test him. So verse 23, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Verse 29, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. Verse 30, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land. Verse 35, I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it. God is not to be trifled with. We must fear lest we grow too comfortable in his long-suffering and his grace and presume upon his mercy. It's maybe about a year and a half ago, uh, we had 
uh, some signs of mouse problems in our garage. So I went to a hardware store and got a couple of those plastic hinge spring activated mouse traps and it said to put them along the wall. So I put them along the wall of the garage and checked them every couple weeks and nothing, but didn't see any more signs of mice either, so I thought maybe it was, it was just a, uh, uh, maybe just a vagabond mouse that had passed through and found greener pastures somewhere. Um, but then one day I was tinkering out in the garage and uh, some motion caught the corner of my eye and here was this mouse scurrying around, uh, just kind of darting from place to place among the, the debris in our uh, somewhat cluttered garage. And uh, so I th it, was, uh, it was a summer day, all the kids were home. I thought, oh, the kids are going to love to see this. But I didn't want to take my eye off it. So I texted Sarah and said, oh, bring the kids out to see this mouse. So she brings the kids out, and we spotted it, and they said, oh, look at it. And we were following it, go around, uh, and watching this mouse, all six of us there in the, uh, I guess there's five of us probably at that time. Okay, yeah, there's not a lot of entertainment at Stephen's house. Okay, so, so we're watching this mouse, and oh, look at, oh, look at him breathing. Oh, look at him uh, uh, looking for food, and then, then he started along the wall toward. I remembered, oh, that's, that's right where my mouse trap is, and so that I originally put that there because I wanted to catch a mouse. Suddenly, I found myself saying, oh, don't, don't go in there now. I, I mean, I don't really want the whole family to have to witness that. Well, you know, that little mouse went up to that mouse trap and walked along, and. And you know that booger jumped right through the thing. He walked right across it, kept going, and never tripped it. And uh, pretty soon he came back the other way and didn't trip it again. I thought, oh, that little stinker. Now suddenly, at first I wanted to catch it, then I hoped not to catch it, but now I was kind of angry I hadn't caught it. And I thought, I'm going to have to get a new trap for this thing or something. Well, he hid, and the family went inside and forgot about it, checked the traps again later and nothing. But uh, that one day several months later uh, I pulled out the rolling trash can and looked back in the corner of the corner I don't often look in at where I'd put the other trap and um, the kids are all not in here okay there was this little skeleton little patches of fur attached to it and the trap finally caught up with him he got a little too brave and you know, that can remind us a sobering warning that when we get a little too comfortable around sin and when we dabble with it and we cross some boundaries and we go into some taboo territories that at first we know we shouldn't but nothing happens, apparently seem to walk away unscathed and go a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more complacent. But there comes a time when God says, that's it. These ten times they've tested me, and now I swear in my wrath, a harsh consequence is coming as a result of hard-hearted unbelief. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that will he also reap. Be sure your sin will find you out. He that to the flesh, uh, so to the flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption. That's what I saw in that mouse trap that day. That's what corruption looks like. And you can picture that rotted carcass and the carcasses of those Israelites, thousands of them a, a, a week maybe. If you kind of do the math over those 40 years, some days more, some days less. God harshly judges hard-hearted unbelief. And yet, there is the hope of his forgiveness, of, of being fruitful for him, and of his rest. Uh, I like that wording in verse 1. Let us fear, therefore, lest a promise being left to us of entering into his rest. Well, the writer is helping us to know that even though hard-hearted uh, unbelief is judged harshly, that we can strive uh, for a rest that God gives of eternal peace to those who, who follow Him faithfully, to those who trust Christ as Savior, and He wants us to live in such a way that is, is deserving of, is, is, uh, 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 is uh, informed by that promise, motivated by it, so that we would live faithfully. And the picture, once again, maybe that the writer wants us to picture is God's rest 
And the door is open to that rest. It was open back in Numbers chapter 14 when they reached the border and it was time to go into the promised land and enter God's rest and that door was open and Israel chose not to enter. End of verse 2. They came short of it. However, the writer wants us to know that that door is open yet today. An opportunity to enter God's rest still exists. And yet the risk of falling short of it also still exists for those who are not truly saved. Again, remember the writer of Hebrews is writing to people, Israelites, who have this strong pressure to revert back to Judaism. And those who have come to the church and have heard the gospel and have heard about the crucified and resurrected Christ and have experienced even his grace to some degree but turn their back and instead of trusting him truly as Savior, they turn back to the way of Judaism. And there's a risk of falling short of that rest. Uh, there's a risk even of bel- for believers of uh, not experiencing that rest in our earthly lives. We can rest in Jesus when we are living faithfully. Um, not experiencing that rest to the fullest in the next life when there is the loss of reward because of our failure to live faithfully, because of hard-heartedness. Those judgments are serious. doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. You won't fall short of heaven because you fail to live faithfully as a believer. However, if you are a believer, new-hearted belief ought to be characterized by perseverance. So with that door to rest open, while it is called today... We want to have soft hearts. We want to live in keeping with that invitation. Uh, Verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Uh, As he said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works works were finished from the foundation of the world. Okay, remember he says God's rest is still open even though his rest started way back after the sixth day of creation, the seventh day since time began, That's when that door opened. That's when God began his rest and he invited Israel into it. When Jesus came and ministered on earth in the first century, he invited uh, those who sat under his ministry to it. Uh, And today he invites us to rest in him and to enter his eternal rest. Uh, Verse 4, For he spake in a certain place, and that certain place is Genesis 2-2, of the seventh day on this wise as God and God did rest the seventh day from all his works and in this place again uh, this place would refer to Psalm 95 um, if they shall enter into my rest seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein in other words since that door is still open but since there's a risk of falling short of it and they to whom first It was first preached, entered not in because of unbelief. That's the Israelites at the border of Canaan. The door was open to them. They fell short of it because of unbelief. And uh, complex sentences the writer of Hebrews uses. But if you want to, he's going to continue the thought uh, into verse 11. And really, you could almost parenthesize uh, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10 are all kind of an aside, aside, subordinate, auxiliary clause to what he's saying. So let's read it that way from 6 and we'll jump straight to 11. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Jump straight to verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter that rest. Okay, since the door is still open but since those people can fall short of it as we saw in that Israelite generation, uh, let us labor. Let us strive to have that new hearted belief that claims God's eternal peace. Uh, but let's look at, at those uh, verses that we parenthesize uh, mentally there for a moment. Again, verse 7, he limiteth or appoints or denotes a certain day, saying in David, today. Okay, so look at chapter 3, verse 7, today, if you will hear God's voice. He's quoting David, Psalm 95, the same word, today, if you will hear his voice. Uh, Notice for a moment there something about the character of Scripture, that who is speaking when we read Scripture? Well, chapter 3 and verse 7 says, wherefore the Holy Ghost says. And chapter 4 and verse 7 says, 
he's saying in David today. So the Holy Spirit is speaking, but he's speaking through the instrument of the human psalmist. And so when someone tries to tell you that uh, they don't trust the Bible because it was written by people and it's a human book, that's a common perspective in our culture, right? this is one of the verses you can take them to, that that's not how the Bible speaks of itself. The Bible sees it as material that comes from the Holy Spirit, and he merely spoke in or through human authors bearing them along. Verse 7, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, in other words, the original today, to the Israelites at the border of Canaan, 400 years passed, and David still says, today there's an opportunity to have a soft heart and enter that rest. And the writer of Hebrews is carrying that forward to us today and saying it's, this is still today. As long as you're still alive and Jesus has not yet returned, that door is open, but the risk of falling short is also a reality. After so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Okay, verse 8. Uh, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Okay, so in other words, if the Israelites, when they did make it into the promised land, not that generation that had to die in the wilderness because of unbelief, but the next generation did go in and they did conquer it. So did they experience God's rest and that door is closed now and, and uh, that circle is complete? No, the writer is arguing that they... Though they made it into Canaan, they have not fully experienced God's rest. They continued to rebel in Canaan, were not faithful, and uh, have not fully experienced that. Uh, just an interesting side note, not arguing anything here, but for, for if Jesus, the starting of verse 8, uh, the Hebrew name Yeshua, the Greek equivalent is Jesus, and we actually have two English equivalents, Joshua and Jesus. The context would tell us here which one is referred to and uh, could quite uh, likely be Joshua if, because Joshua is the one that eventually leads the Israelites into the promised land, but Joshua didn't give them rest, uh, though he did help them to enter uh, through that door and through the border of Canaan. There remaineth therefore, verse 9, a rest to the people of God. For he that entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Well, now we know that entering that rest isn't something we can fully experience here on earth uh, because uh, the rest is characterized by when we cease from our works as God did from his. Well, that's not talking about retirement. Those of you who are retired know that you stay busy, that there's still work to do, and you understand that there's no spiritual retirement that we continue to labor for the Lord as long as he lends us breath. Uh, we know that God's rest is not a spiritual arrival where you reach some stage of enlightenment or a second work of grace or a sinless perfection where you no longer have to strive anymore on this earth and you reach God's rest here on earth. Uh, no, it's not a rival. Paul writes in Philippians 3, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So Christian, as you struggle with sin, as you experience striving, that striving should not make you doubt your salvation because striving will always be part of the Christian walk. And Paul said, the things which I would do, I do not, and the things which I would not, that I do. And if that bothers you, that can actually be a sign of, of being a genuine believer, that that sin struggle bothers you, and you're confessing, and you're repenting, and you're striving to persevere. Uh, because for the unbeliever, that repeated sin doesn't tend to bother. And they don't confess and repent and their life is characterized by sin. Strive, because new-hearted belief is characterized by perseverance. Verse 11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Rest, because God's finished work affords eternal peace. That's his promise. That's what we look for. That's what we invest in today. 
commit to have a soft heart when God speaks. As you open His Word daily, as you come to Sunday school, and men's book study, and ladies' book study, and Wednesday night Bible study, and Sunday night learn service, and Wednesday uh, Sunday morning worship service, and, and it's your family devotions or your one on one Bible studies that you engage in during the week, commit to have a soft heart when God speaks. Let a healthy, reverent fear of grieving God and of angering God cut through the rationalizations that trap you in apathy. Ah, the Israelites had all these well-thought-out excuses at the border of Canaan. And from an earthly perspective, they made sense. But the problem that kept them from God's rest wasn't that the Canaanites were too big. It wasn't that their weapons were sharper wasn't that they were more militarily fortified. It wasn't that the Israelites were too small. The problem wasn't that they didn't have a good enough strategy. So those are the reasons that they pointed to to justify their decisions. The problem, from God's perspective, was that those people had hard hearts. And we so easily can fail to fulfill what God has for us in our lives and to claim the spiritual progress and blessing he wants to uh, be real in us and through us as we minister to others and as we exalt his name. That can be forfeited uh, when we make excuses and when we rationalize and fail to strive faithfully and persevere. Rest in what Jesus has done and let his promise of perfect rest and eternal peace motivate you to be busy for him, to labor, verse 11, to enter into that rest, to know that we haven't clocked out yet, that we uh, will never reach that point in this life, that as long as he lends us breath, we're going to work for the night is coming. We're going to be faithful. We're going to be about his business as servants in his kingdom, as citizens of his city, as soldiers in his army, as farmers in his field, striving, laboring, seeking to be useful, making every effort to be fruitful on earth and to finish all he has called us to do until that blessed sweet day comes that we cease from all our work even as God has ceased from his is still active, is still at work in the world today, but his creative work is finished, and Israel, that generation failed to follow their Yeshua, though he gave a positive report of the Israelites' ability to take Canaan, they wouldn't follow their Yeshua by faith into the promised land. Let's not be like that generation. Let's boldly and confidently follow our Yeshua into unknown territories, over hurdles, and past obstacles, into what he has for us as we labor for him until that day that we rest eternally from all our works. In the meantime, we have a rest that we enjoy of just knowing that he is our Savior, that we are under God's wing, that we are safe in his hand, and so we rest in the joy of all he is.